All right, everyone. So, so uh, no, nobody's in here yet. Do you want me to go ahead and add them from the waiting room? Uh, looks like we have. Oh yeah. Well, let me uh, let me admit all here. Okay. So we have your team joined. A few more in the waiting room here. Awesome. Oh, thank, thanks for catching that. I would have uh, I would have assumed they were already in, in the meeting. Oh, I was trying to get our uh, startup not quite as broadcasted, but fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, well, so everyone is now in the meeting, I guess. Um, so we can uh, go ahead and get started here. Um, so hi, I'm I'm Dr. Graham. I'm a professor here in nuclear engineering and radiation science, and the uh, reactor director. I'm here on the uh, on the Zoom call with uh, Ethan Tabor, who's the reactor manager. Uh, he's currently, uh, I think, in the control room here. Um, so we're in the uh, Missouri s and nuclear research reactor. Um, I guess we still have a few people joining us here. So uh, we're going to just kind of, you know, show you around a little bit as a virtual tour um, and get some some different shots of the facility and um, make sure I'm admitting everyone here to the room. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, you know, some of the, the reactor physics that's involved in, in uh, nuclear reactor operations. Um, and then I think if you have any questions, you know, we'd be happy to we'd be able to answer those. So uh, feel free to use the chat window or uh, you can also unmute yourself and uh, and just go ahead and, uh, you know, shout out a question. So let me go here and uh, maybe we can start with a little bit of a quick tour of the uh, of the reactor core and the control room. And uh, so you can get kind of a look around. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll, I'll kind of talk about some things uh, nuclear related. So uh, why don't we get a shot, uh, Ethan, if we can on the uh, on the blue glow and I'll turn the lights off here and hopefully they can see a nice shot there. OK, so great. So let me turn the lights off. Okay, so hopefully you can see that a little bit better. Um, so right now the camera is pointed towards the uh, the core of our reactor, um, and so it's it's glowing, right? And so what's actually happening is the reactor is giving off a tremendous amount of radiation, mostly in the form of gamma rays, which um, mostly in the form of gamma rays um, into the water, uh, which will knock electrons loose from from their orbitals. Okay, so we have water molecules, electrons are spinning around. The gamma rays, which are high energy particles of light, are gonna knock those electrons loose. And what's gonna happen is those electrons are gonna have so much energy, so much kinetic energy, that they're actually traveling very close to the speed of light, okay? So the speed of light in outer space in a vacuum is three times 10 to the eight meters per second, all right? So those electrons are probably traveling, you know, some of them 99.9% .9 of the speed of light. Now, the thing is in water uh, and in other materials, the speed of light is not three times 10 to the eight meters per second. It's not as fast as it is in outer space. So the, the water molecules actually slow down light a little bit. So it's more like 2.2 times 10 to the eight. Okay, so you know maybe two thirds or, or a little bit more of the speed of light, but certainly not the speed of light. So the electrons are actually moving faster than the speed of light in water. And so what happens is when charged particles move faster than the speed of light in their medium, uh, they create something like a sonic boom, all right? So electromagnetic sonic boom instead of a sonic boom of sound. But if you've uh, you know been to a football game and the, the jets fly over the stadium, you know you hear the sonic boom, and that's what occurs when the jets are, are flying faster than the speed of sound. And so with the electrons, they're kind of like the jets, and they're flying faster than the speed of light and water, and they create this uh, brilliant blue glow. Uh, now on the on the screen here, it may not be quite as blue, but in, in uh, you know person, uh, it has this really intense uh, blue glow, all right? So as we raise the reactor power, uh, we start to see this light. Now, what we can't see here are uh, all the other particles. And one of the really important particles in a nuclear reactor is a neutron, okay? So the neutron is, is really kind of what makes the reactor go. And it's, it's really important for the chain reaction. So I think what maybe I'll do is I'll share screen here and kind of talk you a little bit through the facility. And then we'll uh, take a shot of the uh, uh, the control room. So hopefully you can all now see that, okay? And this is uh, just a still image, um, a little bit further out from the from the core. Um, so you still see the the blue light. And by the way, this is called Cherenkov radiation has a special name, uh, but again, it's from those really fast electrons, okay? Now, uh, this is all underwater. So it's in a, in a, a giant pool, 30,000 gallon pool, all right? 
So it's submerged under a lot of water, um, about 20 feet of water from the top of the core uh, to the top of the pool, all right? And the water does a few things for us, one of which is that it's a good shielding material. So it provides, uh, it provides a stability to see, because of course water is transparent, uh, the reactor, but we're not harmed by the uh, intense radiation coming off of it, all right? Another thing that the water does for us is it absorbs the heat that's uh, produced by the fuel. Um, for us, heat is kind of a waste product. We don't, we don't use it for anything, but uh, at, a, at a, a nuclear power reactor, thank you, at a nuclear power reactor, of course, the heat is the main product. So what we would do is we would, of course, use the heat to uh, boil water and turn it to steam and then turn a turbine. Um, so at a research reactor, water, the heat is sort of a byproduct. And what we're really after is the neutrons, okay? And then the third thing that the water does, uh, and I'll mention that a little bit uh, here in a second, is it, it slows the uh, neutrons down from a high energy to a low energy. So this facility was built in uh, 1960, started uh, construction in 1960, and achieved criticality in 1961. Um, and so this facility is actually the oldest nuclear reactor in the state of Missouri. There are two others. There's a, a power reactor um, near Fulton, Missouri, uh, the Callaway Nuclear Generating Station. And there's an, another research reactor, kind of a similar kind of design reactor to ours, higher power at the, uh, at the uh, University of Missouri uh, at Columbia, okay? So here's a picture of it back in the old days. You can see the, uh, you know, the, the antique cars there. Uh, the outside of the building looks pretty much the same as it did back then. The, the only real difference is there's now a front office which is connected to the building. And of course, we have color now. So, so it's a 200 kilowatt pool type reactor. So this is how much thermal uh, energy or thermal power we generate, okay? So the amount of energy released by the fuel is 200 kilowatts, up to 200 kilowatts. We can operate at powers below, uh, below uh, 200 kilowatts as well. But again, we don't generate any electricity. Okay, so all of that heat that's produced, you know, just goes into the water um, and it gets wasted. But at a nuclear power plant, of course, we want to use that heat to uh, generate electricity. So what do we use our reactor for? Well, it's used for teaching primarily. We also use it for training. So we have reactor operators who are who are students here, um, and to get to get licensed to become a reactor operator, you go through a training program, um, and that culminates in, in taking an exam. Uh, which if you pass, you get a, an operator's license. Okay, we also use it for research. So whether you're an undergraduate student or a graduate student, you have the ability to use the reactor to you know, perform experiments, uh, maybe you know, as, part of a, as part of a thesis or a senior project. All right, here's kind of a cutaway of the core. Um, and so what we see here is the, or cutaway of the, the pool rather, what we see down here is the core. Uh, and it's basically suspended on an aluminum tower, okay? And so that's just right behind me here. And the aluminum tower again goes uh, 20 some feet down under the water surface. And, uh, and that's where we have the fuel. Um, interestingly, this reactor design uh, is actually, um, we can actually move the reactor at different locations within the pool. So it can be completely surrounded by water. It can also be um, surrounded on one side by what's called a thermal column. So it's basically just a bunch of graphite bricks um, and that has a, an important use in, in, in changing the energy of the neutrons. Okay, so a little bit about how a nuclear reactor works, right? So some of you will have heard of a nuclear chain reaction. Um, the idea being, you know, you start with a neutron and maybe a, a fissile nucleus, so uranium-235, right? And it absorbs a, a neutron and some other things happen, right? So we have our, our atom and the atom uh, contains three ingredients, electrons, protons, and neutrons. Now the electrons uh, give us the chemical properties um, of matter, but the protons and neutrons determine the nuclide or the, the specific type of, of uh, isotope of a chemical element uh, that we're, we're talking about, right? So for example, hydrogen is just a single proton without any neutrons. Helium is two protons, two neutrons. And then we work our way up the periodic table and up the chart of nuclides get all the different isotopes of all of the different chemical elements. Now, protons are positively charged particles and neutrons are, are neutral particles, they have no charge. But the neutrons help hold the nucleus together because without the neutrons, the protons would all just sort of fly apart from each other. Okay, so it seems like the neutrons aren't doing a whole lot, right? They're just sort of holding the nucleus together. Uh, but the neutrons are kind of the key player in a chain reaction. So let's say we look at a specific nuclide uh, and this is an isotope of the heaviest naturally occurring element, uranium. 
Okay, so of all of the, the elements you can find in Earth's crust, uranium is the, the one that has the highest atomic number. So it's 92 protons and 143 neutrons, which gives a, a, a total of 235 nucleons, which determines its mass. So uranium-235 has this interesting property that if a neutron um, is shot at it, it gets absorbed by the nucleus, and that makes it very unstable, and it blows apart into two, into two fragments. Okay, these are called fission products. And most of the energy that's released in one of these events is the kinetic energy of these fission products. But in addition to that, we get neutrons. And we can get two, three, sometimes more, sometimes less. Let's say three on average. Neutrons. Um, now, what do these neutrons do? Well, if we have three neutrons, and each of those neutrons gets absorbed by uranium-235 nucleus, uh, then those can potentially undergo fission and split and give off more neutrons. So we have one to start with. The one gets multiplied into three. Three gets multiplied into nine, nine into 27. You get the idea. So this is exponential growth, all right? So this is a nuclear chain reaction. Now, in addition to this, every time we have one of these fission events, a bunch of energy is released, okay? And ultimately it becomes heat. So that energy, of course, is very useful because we can use it to make electricity. Now, there's some other things that occur in a nuclear reactor that this little cartoon doesn't show. For one, between the, the point where the neutron is created and when it gets absorbed again, most of the time, it's gonna lose most of its energy. In fact, if it doesn't happen, the reactor is gonna be very inefficient. So we actually want the neutron to lose most of its energy. The other thing is we don't need all of these neutrons. Okay, so if we're multiplying by three every time, you know, pretty soon this re chain reaction is gonna get out of control. So we wanna have, we wanna have a way of, of removing neutrons and, and controlling the number of neutrons we remove. And that's how we actually control the power of the reactor. So our fuel is, uh, let me quickly grab a thing here. So we have what's called plate fuel. Now I'm gonna to try to hold this up to the camera and, and you can maybe see that you can look through it, okay? So you see the light coming through the other side. So the fuel element, this is just a, a cross section of it. Okay, the whole thing is about a yard long. Um, it has these metal plates. And the plate is actually a sandwich of, of three things. There's an aluminum cladding plate on the outer side. So the, the, two, the two faces uh, that are in uh, contact with the water, that's just aluminum. And then inside there's a fuel meat and it, you probably won't be able to see it very well from the, the webcam here, but it's a little bit of a darker band and that contains the uranium. So it's a mixture of uranium and silicon and aluminum all kind of sandwiched together. Um, and so that contains the fissile material. Now, if we just had fuel and nothing else, the reactor would have to either be very, very large um, or we would have to really increase the concentration of uranium-235 to get a chain reaction. So it's not efficient uh, without the water. So one of the other things the water does is it slows neutrons down. So it's a shield, it's a heat sink, but it also takes the energy away from the, from the neutrons. And that's basically gonna occur through, that's gonna basically occur through uh, collisions, right? If you're playing billiards or something or ping, or um, 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 oh, what's the name of the, the, the game? Um, pinball, yeah, sorry, pinball. Uh, you're talking about a marble or a billiard ball, which is colliding with other objects. And in doing so, it's changing the momentum and the energy of that, of that uh, object, right? Of that moving body. Similar idea here, the neutron collides with nuclei and through those collisions, it transfers its energy to those nuclei and it slows down. So the water is, is basically doing that for us. The neutrons hit the, the protons and the water molecules, they slow down. And when they slow down, they're much more likely to be absorbed by uranium-235. So it makes the reactor essentially more efficient. We don't need as much fuel to achieve, uh, to achieve a critical state. So water is commonly used because water is two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen and protons, i.e. hydrogen, uh, have the same mass as the neutrons. And when neutrons uh, collide off something that has approximately the same mass, they transfer energy very efficiently. Okay, so if you're playing billiards, you know, you shoot the cue ball at the eight ball and the, the, uh, the energy is transferred uh, very efficiently. Okay, you can transfer zero to 100% of the energy. Whereas if you're playing billiards with a ping pong ball and a bowling ball, you know, it's, the collisions are going to occur, but the energy transfer is very inefficient. So water works well just because it has a lot of protons in it. Anything that has a lot of hydrogen is actually a good moderator typically. 
We also use graphite. Uh, graphite is 12 times heavier than a neutron, so maybe not as efficient per collision uh, for a neutron, but it has some other nice properties which make it good at slowing neutrons down. So we use water primarily at MSTR, but we also have some graphite, uh, as I showed you from that thermal column. So after the fission event occurs, we have our neutrons that are produced, and those neutrons will slow down in the water, and then they're much more likely to cause an additional fission event to, to happen. So actually, let me take a pause here um, and, and double check and see if we have any, any questions in the chat. I don't see any right now. So um, what you actually see here on the screen is a, a, a shot of the control room. So you know, when, when we're operating, we have a control room operator who's sitting behind this desk uh, mm -hmm. and they're using those instruments and uh, controls to essentially change the, the reactor power to start up, to shut down, to perform different maneuvers. So part of being a reactor operator is understanding what all of those different uh, instruments do and what they mean, okay? So uh, part of it is, is knowing kind of the reactor physics and, and understanding the, the point of taking a measurement and how that translates into a value in the control room. But also there's just a lot of procedures that, uh, that go into operating and operating safely. So let me go back to, oh, I think Ethan is gonna show you here um, the full fuel elements and control rod elements. Can you go ahead so can, Tegan, can you, can you, uh, perfect. So Ethan has in his hands, can you hold it down a little bit further? Yeah. Uh, so that's a, a dummy fuel element. So that's basically how large the fuel elements are. And if you take a cross section out of one of those, um, that's what I was showing you earlier here with this piece. So that has, uh, you know, that has these fuel plates uh, running down the length of it. Okay, we have a couple of questions here, it looks like. Is it possible to use a thorium isotope instead of uranium in that current reactor? So we use uranium-235 in our reactor, but there's a, a, a concept out there uh, of a thorium breeder reactor. Thorium is actually not fissile. There's no isotope of thorium, which is fissile. But what you can do is when you irradiate thorium with neutrons, so you put thorium in a nuclear reactor, you irradiate with neutrons, it'll produce another isotope of, your, of uranium, uranium-233, which is fissile. So thorium reactor is a little bit more complex for that reason, because we have to actually take this essentially inert thorium, non-fissile thorium, irradiate it with neutrons. Um, and then in, in doing so, we produce uranium-233, which is then producing the power for the reactor. So it's a very different design of reactor from what we have. And so we use just uranium-235 as most reactors uh, use, um, but that is certainly a possibility. Okay, then somebody else asked here, uh, how long would it take if the reactor was uh, fully shut down for it to start back up? Um, so it can be restarted pretty quickly. Um, I mean, we could probably say, you know, depending on, what you consider fully shut down, um, I would say maybe within a within a half hour, something like that. Um, so yeah, you're kind of fighting some different instruments and and the, the decaying neutrons and, and doing that, but it's a it's fairly a quick uh, process to restart. So now so Ethan is. Do they mean our reactor or any reactor in general? Well, probably our reactor because because other reactors it's not so not so quick to start up. Um, so at a, at a nuclear like at a, at a power station, okay. Uh, startup processes take several days, at least, all right? And in, in fact, startup um, is, is sort of stretched out because there's a lot of, uh, for example, thermal stresses on the uh, on, on all of the um, structural materials um, that have to, you know, be released slowly. Uh, so if you were to, to try to bring the reactor to full power at a nuclear power plant, um, that would that would actually put a lot of uh, stress on your on your reactor materials. Um, and there's many other systems that you know make make startup fairly complicated at a at a nuclear power plant. Let's wait for that sound to go away. Yeah, this one. This is the. I don't know if you can hear me now, but we have a, a tank of liquid nitrogen be, behind us and. Uh, as it heats up, the, the nitrogen pressure builds up and it has to release every so often. So that's the sound. Okay, so that's done. Um, now, as far as how quickly we can shut down a reactor, well, in an emergency shutdown situation, we can shut it down within less than a second. So um, Ethan is now holding a control rod element. So hopefully you can all see that. From the outside, it looks like a fuel element, right? 
But the, the main difference is that there is a, a metal bar, a stainless steel bar that goes down the middle of it. Okay, and that bar absorbs neutrons. So by raising and lowering that rod, uh, we, can, we can control the reactor. We have four of those in our core um, and essentially operating the reactor, changing the power, shutting down, starting up, involves raising that to different heights. And from that, we can control you know, the, the absolute power, the rate of change of the power. Um, so that there's really only four moving parts in a nuclear reactor, I mean, in our nuclear reactor, let's say. Uh, and it's, it's really the heights of these four control rods. So it's sort of interesting. Um, so there's another question here. Can this be used to simulate potential disasters for training operators? Uh, yeah, so we, I mean, as part of training, um, it's important to, to, you know, train for different types of accident scenarios, different type of, um, you know, accidents maybe that, it, that happen inside the facility or they could be natural, uh, natural disasters. So we have, you know, emergency plan and emergency um, plan training and training for the operators. Uh, and so we, you know, we keep every, everyone uh, up to speed on that and it's a very important part of the training program. So there are many different sort of scenarios that we look, uh, we look at. Uh, for, for keeping everyone well trained on um, on disasters. So it could be anything from like an experiment going wrong to let's say a tornado sweeping through town to, you know, I don't know, some kind of a, uh, like a bomb threat on campus. I mean, different sorts of things uh, like that we have to we have to be trained for. Okay, so since uh, Ethan is holding the uh, control uh, control element, let me uh, let me move on to that. So let me do screen share again here. All right, that's a perfect transition actually. So we're talking about control rods. So if we have just fuel and water, we might have a chain reaction, but uh, you know, if we get the chain reaction started, how do we stop it, okay? Or how do we increase the rate of the chain reaction or slow it down? So that's where we use the control rods. So the control rods go in, the reactor power goes down, the control rods go up, the reactor power goes up. So first approximation, that's kind of how a nuclear reactor works. So these control rods contain um, the element boron, Okay, boron, like borax, okay, used to kill ants, right? It's a relatively abundant um, element found in Earth's crust. And it turns out it has this nice property, which is that it likes to absorb neutrons, it absorbs them very well. And when neutrons are absorbed and we don't produce any additional neutrons in the absorption process, we essentially get rid of those neutrons. Um, and in doing so, we can control the overall population of neutrons, hence the chain reaction. So we can, we can get the, the rods to a certain height where the number of neutrons we started with, let's say in, in generation one, will be roughly the same as the number of neutrons in generation two. And so that's essentially how reactor uh, control works. So we have the fuel here, the control rods, the water, rods inserted, the reactor shut down, rods withdrawn, the power increases, and also it changes the rate of change of the, the power increase. So how quickly we come up to power or shut down uh, is also uh, determined in part by the, the height of the control rods. Now, I think one thing uh, uh, to mention here is, uh, you know, this, this uh, control rod element on the top of it, it has kind of a cylindrical, um, you know, uh, a, a cylindrical um, shaped piece of metal. That's actually electromagnetically coupled to the mechanism that raises and lowers it, okay? So there's a, a mechanical mechanism that's driven by a by a worm gear, and uh, that goes up and down, uh, and that stretches all the way down to the to the top of the core. And at the the end of that um, at the end of that um, extension, we have an electromagnet. Okay, so when the electromagnet is energized, the rods can be raised and lowered. When the power is turned off to the electromagnets, they're not energized, um, and and we're not going to be able to raise and lower them. But this is actually uh, there's a safety reason behind this. Okay, if we needed to do an emergency shutdown, it's called a scram. An emergency shutdown basically involves taking the power away from the electromagnet, so de-energizing the electromagnets. In other words, cutting the current that's flowing through the electromagnets. And um, when, they, when they're de-energized, they no longer work as magnets and the control rods uh, fall under the influence of gravity back into the elements and that shuts down the reactor. So as long as gravity is working, okay, we can, we can always do a, a, an emergency shutdown, do a reactor scram. All right, so we have three ingredients. We have fuel, we have moderator and control rods. And basically those are the three most important ingredients to have a, a nuclear reactor. And from that, we can generate a steady amount of power. So the entire process now looks something like this. 
we have our fission events, the neutrons are produced, the neutrons then uh, get moderated, they slow down, some of them are absorbed into control rod uh, elements, some of them will be absorbed by the fuel. Here, the, the, the uranium uh, nuclei are kind of floating around in the water, but of course that's in the fuel, and then the process continues. Now in a commercial uh, nuclear power plant, um, all of that heat that's generated, uh, all of that power that's generated is going to heat water and it's at some point um, in the system is gonna boil water, converting it to steam and turning turbines. Turb turbines turn a generator, generator generates electricity and that's how we get power, okay? So the reactor part is different from other power, uh, power systems from coal power plants uh, and such, um, but everything else is kind of similar, okay? It's a, it's a hot water heater essentially. So we, we use steam to turn a turbine. But what really makes nuclear reactors different um, is that instead of you know, harvesting chemical energy, we're harvesting nuclear energy. So to kind of put some, some uh, you know, perspective on this, uh, let's look at how much energy we all use every year. So typical citizen and living in the US is gonna use around 11,000 kilowatt hours per year, okay? Give or take, depending on where you live, how much uh, you consume, but, you know, powering your phones, your computers, refrigerators, air conditioners, all that kind of stuff. That's your, your consumption on average. Okay, now we can get energy from, from chemical sources or from, you know, from nuclear sources. So if we have one kilogram of coal, that's going to give us around six hours of power, right? So considering, uh, you know, it's okay, four times for a day and then 365 for a year, and then for, you know, the average lifetime of a person, that's an awful lot of coal, okay? Now, if we have one kilogram of oil or natural gas, we do a little bit better, a bit more efficient, around 12 hours of, of electricity for the typical person in the US. Still a lot of, uh, a lot of resources. If we have one kilogram of pure uranium-235, that's gonna generate the needs of basically 20 people for over their lifetime. So 20 people for 100 years. So in one little lump of metal, you have an awful, uh, an awfully large amount of, of energy, all right? And that's the difference between basically rearranging atomic bonds and splitting the atom, okay? So we're, we're taking the famous equation equals mc squared here, and we're shaving a little bit of mass off of the nucleus. In fact, the, most, for the most part, the mass doesn't change a whole lot, but we shave off a little bit of mass in splitting the atom, and by multiplying by the speed of light squared, we get a, a massive amount of uh, energy, okay? So in this little pellet of, of fuel, uh, that, gener that uh, is gonna generate quite a lot of power for qu quite a lot of people. All right, now let's look at our resources again, but here shown a little bit more visually. Here we have a nuclear reactor, which by the way is, is very large. Okay, a nuclear power reactor is very large. It's the size of a crane. And this mountain of coal is the equivalent amount of energy that would be uh, generated by that core, okay? And keep in mind that this mountain of coal is gonna produce a very large volume of CO2. The nuclear reactor produces no CO2. Okay, so if you're looking for a way to, um, you know, to reduce the production of greenhouse gases, but also uh, produce a lot of electricity and, and, and feed the demands of, of uh, all the people that, that you know, need that 11,000 uh, 11, uh, kilowatt hours every year, uh, nuclear is a very uh, effective strategy there. Okay, so I'll kind of stop uh, yakking here and maybe take some questions if you have any. So I think I have a hand raised by Mikey. You can either unmute yourself or you can type in the chat. Yeah, sure. Do you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, is there anything special or specific to MST's nuclear reactor? Well, so, you know, all, you know, pretty much every research reactor is a little different. So they all are, are unique in a way. Um, you know, one thing that, that makes our reactor, I, I guess one thing that I guess would define, you know, our reactor is, is um, it's a very student-oriented facility. Okay, so um, there, there's only around you know 20 nuclear reactors that are owned by universities in the United States, so that they're they're not that common to start with. Um, but but even so, I mean, not all of them are very uh, um, open to students. 
all right? You may go through your entire academic career and never really even see the inside of one. It's used for research, maybe. It's used for producing medical isotopes. But at MSDR, it's a student reactor, okay? So you, you come in here, you take classes, you do training. Um, and so it's really a very uh, open facility for our, for our students. Uh, and, and that's something we're very proud of because, you know, s and is a um, really known for it, its uh, excellence in teaching um, and, and training people to, you know, work in, in industry and, and research. And so it's a, it's a valuable resource to our students um, and, and something, you know, you can get involved in as soon as your, as your freshman year. Um, we have, you know, we have uh, trainees who are, are freshmen. We have a class you can take uh, as early as your freshman year. So you can be sitting behind the control console and, and actually operating a nuclear reactor. And there's very few places, you know, um, in the United States, certainly, and, and probably even around the world where that early on in your academic career, you're operating a nuclear reactor. So I think that's kind of what makes us special. Um, as far as the design of the reactor, their reactors have similar kind of fuel um, called MTR fuel. Uh, so a few other universities that have similar fuel, different configuration, maybe the core, different experimental facilities. So, you, you know, you start getting into the, the details there uh, and every reactor is pretty much a, a, a unique beast. So, okay, I think we had a few questions here in the chat and it looks like some of them have been answered here. So let me go up. Um, can you talk about nuclear waste and how it's managed? Okay, so that one's interesting. Um, in the US, I mean, we at one point we were planning on basically burying uh, the spent nuclear fuel under a mountain in Nevada. Um, and it's called Yucca Mountain. Um, if anyone there is from Nevada, maybe you've heard of it. But uh, that, that was kind of, the um, uh, project was killed in part because of political issues with uh, um, a senator from Nevada, you know, basically saying not in my backyard. So it was not popular maybe with, with uh, some Nevadans. Um, and so that project was, was basically killed. And so currently what we do, um, and there's some wisdom in maybe doing this, is, is that we take the, the spent nuclear fuel and we store it on site. So at the nuclear power plants, there are special, um, you know, parts of the site which have, uh, you know, carefully designed uh, waste casts that the, the fuel gets stored in. It's very well shielded, very well protected. Um, you know, and, and the reason that might be a good thing to do is that there's actually some, some use in spent nuclear fuel. First of all, we don't burn all of the, the uh, uranium, all right? So one thing you can do with the spent nuclear fuel is reprocess it. It's kind of like recycling and pulling out the um, uranium and also the plutonium, which is produced. So some of the, some of the fuel, um, uh, or let's say some of the, the sort of waste product in quotes uh, is actually plutonium-239, which is also fissile and, and perfectly, uh, perfectly usable fuel. So getting that um, recycled, reprocessed fuel uh, allows us to use our resources a little bit more um, um, efficiently and, and less wastefully, I guess you could say. So actually France, uh, France does that because they don't really have many uranium uh, natural resources. And so reprocessing is very important. There's other you know, potentially useful um, radionuclides and, and nuclear waste. So you could actually get some medical isotopes out of it. Uh, you could get isotopes for industrial uh, use out of the, the fuel. Um, so currently we're just kind of holding on to it because we don't necessarily know what we want to do with it. And uh, there'll probably be some time before we have a, a sound strategy for, for uh, what we'll do with the, with the nuclear waste. We can either bury it, we can reprocess it. And if we reprocess it, we'll maybe bury it, uh, the, the waste products from that in different locations. Um, so in the US, we're still kind of figuring that one out. Okay, and the, if uh, the nuclear reactor does not produce CO2, does it produce any waste material? Yeah, so the, the nuclear, uh, the spent nuclear fuel uh, is waste and other radioactive material is produced. So uh, handling that, um, you know, is not trivial. It's, it's radioactive, so it can, it, you know, it can definitely pose some hazards. But again, what we call waste is a little bit um, subjective maybe because spent nuclear fuel might be waste, but it might also be a valuable resource, so. Uh, how long does it take to get your license? Okay, it looks like Ethan managed that. So yeah, 12 to 18 months. Can you give a quick overview of how a nuclear submarine works? Yeah, I mean, so a nuclear submarine has a nuclear reactor in it. Um, and essen essentially, um, you know, it dr dr drives a um, propeller. Okay, so I, I don't know so many of the details, right? I mean, part of that's also... Uh, you know, classified material, but uh, uh, I mean, essentially, you're using the the uh, heated heated coolant 
to um, to turn a, a drive shaft, which turns a propeller. And in addition, you have uh, you know a generator for getting electricity to power other other parts of the system. So um, once the fuel is uh, fully used, is there any other use for it? Okay, so I kind of answered a little bit of that. Uh, any way to reprocess spent uranium on site at SNT? So no, we don't. Um, apart from maybe a very small uh, scale experiment, maybe form in the lab with a tiny amount of uranium, a tiny amount of spent fuel, we don't really have any way of doing that. So reprocessing is a complicated, um, uh, requires very specialized facilities where you have you know shielded industrial chemical processes to dissolve the fuel, separate out the uh, the different constituents of the dissolved fuel into different streams, uh, you know, precipitate that out so you get you know maybe your your uranium back, your plutonium, what are called the minor actinides, the fission products, and there's all kinds of different chemical processes involved. Um, so we don't have anything like that at SCT, certainly not an industrial scale. Although I suppose uh, if we had a very small amount of irradiated uh, or uranium um, with the right you know protocols in order for the for the labs. Uh, it might be possible to do, you know, just a, a basic chemical experiment to sort of see uh, the efficiency of a certain extraction process. But anything which is very, um, very radioactive, like actual spent fuel, you know, we are sort of limited in what we can do here on campus. Okay. Just trying to catch up here with the, with the questions. Um, What classes are needed to get a license? So actually the licensing is an extracurricular activity. So um, you don't even have to be a nuclear engineering student technically, um, but it's a it doesn't count for any, any sort of credit. Um, you just sign up for it. Now, typically, you know, our, our, our trainees are gonna be nuclear engineering students uh, because a lot of the, the sort of information that you need to, to really understand at a deep level, um, how a reactor operates, um, it, you know, comes with the, with the classes. So, we have a class that you take in uh, your junior year called reactor physics, for example. But you know, even uh, as early as your freshman year, you're going to understand the the, the key kind of principles in, in, in a not very mathematical way, but enough of a uh, it'll give you enough of a appreciation and intuition for reactor physics, let's say, to uh, be able to operate. Okay, um, you know, there's other information in there about how radiation detectors work. We use radiation detectors essentially to measure the reactor power. So there's another junior class that uh, you'll take on, on radiation detection and measurement. Um, there, you know, there'll be a class you take on thermal hydraulics, which is sort of understanding how heat is uh, carried from the, the fuel to the, the, to the coolant and then to other systems. Um, so it all, it all kind of goes together, but you don't actually have to take any classes uh, with nuclear engineering to, to get a license. It's just very helpful. When working in a nuclear reactor, what is working like? Do you have daily shifts? Yeah, I mean, you know, nuclear reactors, they, they hire, um, you know, not just nuclear engineers, just mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, computer programmers, security guards. I mean, it's, it's a large operation. So there's many different types of work that's done, that's, that's being done. Um, but within operations, yeah, it's usually shift work. So you'll be on a, on a shift with a, usually usually a, a particular team, so. Right, Mikey, I think you're raising your hand again, so go ahead. Does uh, MST replace their fuel on like a typical year and a half period, or do you guys do it less often because you're not constantly running? No, we've actually, uh, well, not since nineteen uh, mid-90s have we replaced our fuel. So we actually burn so very little of the uranium-235 uh, in the fuel um, that we don't, we don't really produce spent nuclear fuel. It's the same fuel since we've had since, the, since uh, 1994, let's say. Um, what, what happened in 1994 is actually we changed the fuel type. So we used to have what's called high enriched uranium fuel, where the concentration of uranium-235 was above 90%, right? Now we use what's called low enriched uranium where the concentration of uranium-235 is below 20%. So 19.75%, um, let's say. Now we burn a little bit of uranium here and there, but the power at our facility is not high enough really that uh, we, we will actually consume the fuel that fast. So effectively, it's the same fuel elements we've had for the last, uh, yeah, for the last 30 years. Eventually, we'll have to replace it, but uh, it still has quite a bit, bit of life in it. And uh, 
What's sometimes more effective is we can swap out fuel elements that have been irradiated less than some of the more highly irradiated elements. And if we need to, we can also add fuel elements. So you'll see here, uh, if you're looking at the at the uh, screen of the of the core, um, there's a grid plate, right? So it's a it's an arrangement of a six by nine um, a six by nine grid that has holes in it. Each of the fuel elements can be moved into one of those holes, and we actually have additional fuel elements we could add, uh, which would increase the amount of uranium in the core. We also have half fuel elements, which only have half as much of the fuel as the standard fuel elements, um, and so we can reconfigure it and and we can add more fuel sometimes if we need to. Um, we can also rearrange the core to perform certain experiments. So, I mean, this is a core we've had now for a little while, but uh, we can move it over maybe a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, depending on the needs of a particular uh, experiment. So it's not a, you know, sort of straightforward thing where you can just do it in a half hour. Um, moving the fuel is a fairly involved operation, but uh, it can be done. So it's a flexible, a flexible design in that regard. Okay, so someone's asking, okay, replying, what opportunities are there for students to do experiments with different fuel types? So we have, a, we're, we're kind of limited in terms of, of uh, doing experiments, fuel, fueled experiments. Um, it is possible, um, but we, you know, we're really li limited by the amount of material that we can irradiate and the amount of power that it can produce. Um, of course, also the encapsulation is very important for safety and the handling of it is important. So we can do some experiments with, with them with uh, fuels containing uh, fissile material, but it's typically going to be really small amounts and it can only generate a certain amount of energy um, depending on wherever you irradiate it. Um, it can be done. So if you're interested in thorium or, or whatever, uh, it can be done, but it's a little bit of paperwork involved and uh, the, the total amount of material we can irradiate is, is limited. Um, now, sometimes the bigger consideration there is handling it afterwards. So even if we put it in the core and we can irradiate it, you know, if you want to, if you want to analyze it, let's say later, um, you know, we have to make sure that the dose rates, the, the, you know, the, the radiation dose rate that you receive is going to be at such a low level that we have no concern about your, your safety. So part of designing an experiment, um, very, very non-trivial part sometimes, is doing the calculations to kind of figure out uh, how much we can irradiate it, what power for how long, what kind of uh, shielding we need after we perform the experiments, because we basically want to be 100% sure that the experiment is going to not produce something that's so hot in terms of its radioactivity that we have to we have to worry about any any student safety. But yeah, there's a way to do it. It's just it requires certain procedures be followed and, and forms be filled out. Okay, so I'm seeing any other questions here? Right. Ethan, anything you wanna add? Um, not especially, if anyone has any questions, either for myself or the operators who are still here, I'm more than happy to answer them. But otherwise, thank you for uh, joining us on the tour, on the visit. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, I hope you uh, got to see something a little bit interesting today. And uh, of course, if you're ever um, in town or on campus and you'd like to see the reactor in person, um, it can be arranged. So a little bit of notice, it can be arranged. Is there someone specific we should contact for that? Yeah, actually, uh, let me see if I have... Oh, uh, you know, I probably don't have my email address, but let me type, let me do a share screen. Uh, actually, I'll just type it in the chat window. That, that works, right? So I'll type into everyone my email address and I'll type in uh, the reactor's email address as well. So that's mine. And reactor at mst.edu, right? I think that one's kind of hard to get wrong, I think. Correct. Okay, and uh, Ethan, is it okay if I add yours as well? Yep, that's fine. Okay, etaber at mst.edu. Okay, so, um, you know, if you want to, if you want to, uh, you can even send it all three of us. We'll, we'll get it one way or another there. That way um, we, can, we can arrange for a tour. So usually, I mean, sometimes we're, 
we're a little bit uh, um, constrained by other things going on, but we get a lot of people through the facility through tours every year. So, you know, sometimes over 2000 people a year. So we're, we're very happy to give tours, especially for people that are interested in the subject. Uh, one last, a couple last questions here, or one last question. Is it possible to get a license if you are not majoring in nuclear engineering? So yes, it's possible. So um, we have an information session at the start of the fall semester. Uh, you can attend. Um, sometimes that doesn't get circulated outside of the major, so it's going to go to nuclear engineering students. Uh, but we we you know encourage anyone who's interested in in attending. Um, so uh, if uh, you know if, if you're here in the fall and you want to get started on that, uh, again use those those email addresses to reach out to us, uh, and we'll try to make sure that you're included on the um, on the on the email uh, that gets sent out uh, telling you about those. Um, info sessions and you can attend and and see if it's something you're interested in doing so all right everyone well unless there's any other questions i think uh oh there's one okay is there any research into nuclear fusion at s t so not a lot we've done a little um you know i can i speak maybe more for myself here um so i, I mostly work in the area of nuclear materials um and so some of some of the work that, that my students and i have done have related to um uh, some of the, the diagnostic components for, uh, for tokamak reactors, so the radiation effects in them. Um, I also had a student a few years ago who was, who was looking at uh, kind of this oddball flavor of fusion called uh, sticky fusion or, or, or muon catalyzed fusion. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's another kind of fusion that um, it, it actually works at much lower temperatures, but there's some energetic issues with it. So he was doing some energy analysis. So we have the, the, uh, the occasional um, project in fusion at s &T, and there's a fusion class you can take that Dr. Castanio, uh, I think, is teaching this semester, fusion fundamentals, a senior level class, 4,000 level class. Um, uh, you learn about the different types of fusion. Um, and then, you know, the occasional research project. We don't have a big, we don't have a big uh, research, uh, research expertise in fusion. Uh, and also, we've had some students in the past who have done internships um, at, at other fusion companies or um, with, with some of the big fusion projects. So we had one student who went to the uh, ITER reactor, which is the, will be the world's uh, largest fusion reactor. And it's in the south of France. So, you know, it's, it's gotta be really rough living in the south of France over the summer. Um, and he got involved there. We had some other students that went to these uh, fusion startup companies uh, and, and did some uh, research there. So there's many possibilities if you're interested in fusion for, for doing that. But it's not a not a huge part of our research portfolio. Okay, well, everyone have a nice evening, and uh, I hope hope to see some of you in uh, person sometime in the future. Could I ask about the muon fusion, actually? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, I just have a little bit of background on this. I know I think that's what Pons and Fleischmann were trying to do way way back with cold fusion like room temperature um is there any validity to that or is it still something that has to be done at extremely high temperatures i mean with with muon catalyzed fusion um it's been demonstrated experimentally it works it's just the question is can you break even right so for the liquid nitrogen is going off again here So, so the issue with uh, with muon catalyzed fusion is you can get fusion to occur with muons, um, but the, the the problem is the muons will get stuck to the 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 ash of the fusion, the alpha particles, and that kind of removes them from the from the process pretty quickly. So, uh, you know, the the conventional wisdom is is always sort. Of, I mean, the the sort of practical um, um, uh, limitation, let's say, of, of cold fusion is you're never going to be able to get as much energy out as you put in. So the project that I had a master's student working on was actually uh, was to try to reactivate the muons that are stuck to the alpha particles using what's called a free electron laser. So it's a special device that you can generate really intense beams of X-rays, and you could re reionize the muon off of the uh, of the, the alpha particle. And and suffice to say, it would work, but the the energy balance is still kind of in the air. So uh, it's probably going to cost a lot more to generate the X-rays. Uh, and to generate the muons that you're ever going to get out of the the reaction, so it was a bit of a, a kind of a fun, odd project. But uh, as far as actual electricity generation, no, I don't think I don't think cold fusion is is going to be the way. Um, there are people that are looking at different types of cold fusion. For the most part, with cold fusion, it, it tends to be the the uh, the land of of quackery, and you have some people who you know are are 
claiming they have cold fusion in the garage or whatever. So you have to be a little careful with that. But there, there is a, a legitimate um, and and you know, uh, there there is an actual uh, um, respectable, I guess, side of, of cold fusion as well. But the, the main approaches that we're using nowadays for um, actually generating you know significant amounts of power with fusion devices are using strong magnetic fields or inertial confinement, which is essentially um, causing the fusion, making the fusion happen really fast before uh, before the plasma can blow itself apart, essentially. So you, you may have seen in the news uh, a month ago or so, the uh, breakthrough at the uh, NIP facility out in California. And so that's an inertial confinement device. Um, and there's some fine print there. So they, they didn't really quite break even because they it takes a lot more energy to charge up the lasers than they ever got out of it. But it's progress. Uh, and uh, you know, some point in the future, we'll probably have break-even fusion. Uh, but even if we do, we're still going to be a long ways away from commercial fusion, right? So once we get break even, and that's where the, the fusion scientists are working hard, there's going to be a lot of engineering to do to uh, get us to the point where we could have a somewhat affordable, maybe, um, nuclear fusion reactor that can actually produce electricity. Currently, fusion reactors are really expensive sort of science fair projects, and uh, it's going to take many, many more decades to turn them into any kind of a, uh, um, you know, commercializable power station, let's say. So the, the joke within the fusion world is that we're always 20 years away. From always 20 years away, that's right. Yeah. yeah, I think we need Q equals 10 or something for it to be really practical right. commercially. Kind of, you know, paradox, yeah, exactly. Do you think um, small modular reactors would be effective in the near future? Seems to be, I mean, there's there's definitely been a lot of progress with licensing them and, and you know, now I guess actually getting them getting ready to build some of them and test them. Um, so yeah, I mean, that it looks to be that we're, we're getting closer to the to small modular reactors. Um, the, the advantage of small modular reactors is that, you know, potentially um, you could have a very standardized design. You could build most of them in a factory, ship their parts up on flatbed trucks, snap them together in a very standardized way. Um, and they would, be, they would be cheap enough that even a, a medium sort of size utility company could buy them, right? With a, a um, say 3000 megawatt, you know, um, conventional light water reactor, they're so expensive and they take, all, you know, so much time to build and license that, you know, you have to be kind of one of the big players um, in the utility world to actually, to actually buy one and, and build one. So, and it, if it takes, you know, it takes more than the uh, a set amount of time to actually build it, you're losing money because the, most of the cost of a, of a nuclear power plant is actually in the construction of it, um, the upfront cost, we say. Whereas uh, once you have it running for a certain number of years, it's actually a lot cheaper in terms of its, in terms of its fuel, let's say, than uh, other, other fuel sources, other energy sources. So getting the economics right is, is one of the driving forces for small modular reactors. And I think we're getting closer to having, uh, having some of them actually uh, built, so. Do you think traditional reactors are the most, I don't know, maybe best form of nuclear energy at the moment then? I know they just take forever to get approved and built. I mean, I think the standardized designs, that there's certainly almost a commodity now around the world. So uh, uh, to a certain extent, as long as you can, as long as you can reduce the uncertainty and the, the construction time um, and the overall cost, I mean, it still makes a certain amount of sense for a utility company that wants to have a diverse portfolio of, of uh, energy sources. But one of the one of the problems it seems like nowadays with um, with with building nuclear reactors is a lot of the expertise has has gone away because it's retired, right? A lot of a lot of the expertise is retired, um, and so we're having to in the U.S. we're having to kind of re-educate ourselves on actually how to build a nuclear reactor. So that that seems to be one of the issues. All righty. Well, so oh, one last There's question. Someone, yeah. One call, which college, uh, what college did you go to to get where you are now? So I went to, uh, I did my undergraduate in Canada at McGill University, which is in Montreal, Quebec. And then uh, I went to the University of Texas at Austin for my, for my master's and PhD degree. So I've kind of bounced around North America a little bit. Now I'm in Missouri, so I'm sort of splitting the difference, right? Between hot and cold and yeah. All right, everyone. Well, I think I'm going to sign off now. So if you have any other questions or some, some question pops in your mind, uh, 
uh, you know, middle of the night or tomorrow or something. Uh, you also have our email addresses, so uh, we'll, we'll be happy to uh, reply to those as well. All right. Thanks so much, care. Mr. Graham. Thank you, Mr. Tabor. Yep. Have a good one. Go ahead and close.